Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 8th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we put the version of the House operating budget currently being considered by the House Finance Committee into context by comparing it to the prior budgets and discuss what we will be looking for as the budget continues to work its way through the legislature this session. Second, we discuss inflation factors and set the baseline for how we will be thinking about the issue as it starts to be raised in the context of legislative budget discussions. And third, we discuss the additional problems for campaign finance created by APOC's decision to abandon any contribution limits on state and local races. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's dive into it here this morning. Um, Let's talk about, well, I I guess I was just kind of riffing on it. The House Finance uh, produced budget, $1,250 PFD, $1,300 energy rebate, which, again, is just all a bunch of you know, voodoo. It's all a bunch of uh, accounting voodoo where they're pulling from a different account and they're saying, well, this equals what the governor wants. It just doesn't give you what the governor said it was. And so thereby denying him any kind of win or leverage in this. Give me your take on it. Well, and and you made a good point earlier. It's still, I mean, even, even you add those two together, it's still a billion dollars short uh, of what the, uh, of what the statutory uh, uh, PFD is. I've done a chart uh, that if I'm if I'm any good at this anymore, I'm going to try to put up on the screen uh, that would, let's see, start sharing. There we go. There we go. You may see it from your end, I hope. Um, are we good? We're good. We're good. Go ahead. Um, okay. So this chart is, it charts uh, the operating, well, the total budget, the total UGF budget and the PFD. Uh, over the last uh, several years. It starts in FY20 um, and takes us through what the House Finance Committee has proposed uh, for this year. Uh, The FY20 budget was $4.49 billion. That's sort of the recent low. Um, That was the last or the next to last Walker budget. And then the last Walker budget uh, ramped up from the $4.49 billion up to $4.81 billion. The first Dunleavy budget was four point seven six. billion. The second Dunleavy budget was 4.64. The third Dunleavy budget was 4.67. And now we're we're at uh, at the fourth and uh, final, at least of the first term uh, Dunleavy budgets. He proposed a budget that's $50 million below what his budget last year was, 4.62. And now we're at the stage where the legislature's got their hands on it and they're starting to deal with it. And And the House Finance Committee has in front of it uh, their proposed uh, committee substitute uh, for uh, for the budget, which would be uh, $4.77 billion. Uh, these are all exclusive of the PFD. I always do the PFD off to the side right. to, try, to try to confuse things. Uh, the legislature always includes the PFD. So when they talk about UGF numbers, they talk about higher UGF numbers because they're throwing in the PFD numbers. Um, and so they've proposed a budget of $4.77 billion. Uh, but they've taken a week off um, to wait for the uh, spring revenue forecast 
uh, which is due out uh, early next week, may come out late this week, uh, due out early next week. I took a look at what that spring revenue forecast is going to look like in last week's uh, uh, landmine uh, column the Friday column I do for the Alaska landmine, and it's going to have substantially higher revenues than what's been forecast before. And a concern is that the reason that the House Finance Committee has taken the week off to wait for the spring revenue forecast is because they want to spend a whole lot more (laughs) than even the $4.77 billion, the the $150 million increase that they've already proposed over the uh, over the governor's proposed budget. Well, and just for a second, Brad, I mean, even going back to last week, things have changed so dramatically here in the last week. Even the numbers you were talking about last week could be uh, low compared to what things could look like uh, coming up into the spring based on what we have right now, right? They could be. Now, you know, people sort of jump and say, oh, it's $130 oil. That, that doesn't mean $130 oil average for a full year. Uh, for FY22, we've got oil prices down as low as in the 50s at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the current fiscal year. And so it's the average prices you look at. For FY23, uh, we're still in backwardation, which means the current price uh, is higher than the than the futures prices. And while and while the FY23 average is coming up, uh, it's not it's not jumping up as fast as we're seeing these daily prices jump up. So you you don't want to make the mistake of saying, oh, it's up so much currently. That means FY23 is going to be up the same amount. It's not. It's it's how the average uh, moves up. We we post. I post daily, right, uh, on, on both the Facebook page and the Twitter page, uh, what uh, what the futures market is telling us about where the average price is for not only this fiscal year but next fiscal year in the in the three or four fiscal years beyond that uh, to try to get some sort of context of what we're looking at. And you can see there that the average prices are coming the the the, the average prices from the futures market are coming up but they're not coming up to the levels or as fast as we're right. seeing the current. There's price. always a lag time, right. And all that. Right. Well, and, and the, and, and the market's anticipating that while we're going through the current crisis, there will be some solutions to the current crisis over time. Right. And, and that will help drive prices back down. Either we'll lose demand uh, or we'll have an increase in supply or a combination of both. Right. Which will, which will help drive the price back down. So okay. it's not, it's it's not it's not so much lag as it is sort of an anticipation of how the market's going to respond uh, to uh, to the current price levels. Okay, sorry, sidebar over. Just wanted to. No, that's okay. <laughs> the the one the one the one the one thing that that the uh, why well, I keep what well, I have this chart up. I want to note is in each of these years uh, from FY uh, nine, from FY twenty on, we've had PFD cuts. I mean, it's not. It, it, it's not that you know we've had we've had solid um, uh, uh, financials even even at the levels at the spending levels that we've been at. Each year we've had significant PFD cuts. In FY19 we had 830 million. FY19 FY20 uh, uh, well those are FY19 we had uh, uh, 80, 830 million. FY20 we had 890 million. Uh, FY21 Dunleavy 820 million, and then FY21 1.23 billion. One point Dunleavy's proposed uh, 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 budget uh, was significantly uh, had a significant PFD cut in it uh, even this year. So it's we, we've had PFD cuts through, and as you were pointing out earlier, even with the uh, energy uh, relief uh, payment that uh, uh, that the House has proposed which we've got in the chart on, in green, even with that energy relief payment, we've still got a billion dollar uh, PFD cut. So the, 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 the legislature continues to finance, even with these high oil prices, the legislature is continuing to finance a part of government with, uh, with PFD cuts. They're continuing to take uh, a significant cut out of the statutory PFD uh, uh, as they, uh, uh, as they, uh, 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 Put, put these budgets together. That's not ending. Uh, even when they tell you, <laughs> well, there's, there's, a, there's an adage I won't use on the air, but, but even when they tell you they're doing good things for you, they're still, they're still uh, 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 even when they tell you it's raining, they're still doing something. Right, else. right. They're still pissing all over you as soon as they're saying it's raining. I get you. I mean, we can say that. That's fine. And that's exactly uh-huh. what I was trying to say earlier. I mean, this is exactly the modus operandi of the business as usual crowd in there. Be happy that we gave you what we gave you. We know it's not what we are supposed to give you. We know that we could ignore the law, but we still know better than you. 
we'll be coming back to this chart uh, uh, throughout throughout the the legislative cycle to to talk about what's going on. But but right now at four point seven seven, uh, we're still higher than we've been in any year during the uh, Dunleavy administration. We're going back to Walker, and this is just the House proposal. This is before this is before House Finance actually acts on it. Right, the House acts on it, or Senate Finance, or Senate. This is this is the House uh, the 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 pending. Uh, what came out of the House committees uh, that's pending before the before the legislature at 4.77. We're going to see whether the legislature actually can keep costs down when revenues are going up. Remember, they all said, oh, we're going to we're going to learn the lesson. Costs are independent of revenues. We're going to keep costs down. We're going to keep spending down, even if revenues go back up. Well, we're going to follow along with this chart and see if that's if that's actually what happens. All right. I'm going to try to back out of the chart now. All right. So as Brad backs out of the chart, we're going to come back over here and uh, and uh, we'll continue. So, uh, again, how does this play out in your mind, Brad? Well, I think I think the legislature, I think we're going to see a lot of activity uh, in the House. I, hopefully we're going to see people advocate uh, for uh, you know, a, a substantial PFD um, uh because we can afford a substantial PFD. I mean, they've told us all these years that we can't afford the PFD, right? I mean, the reason we're not getting the statutory PFD is because we can't afford it. Well, the revenues are going to be there to be able to afford the full PFD and the full statutory PFD. Uh, Rob Myers just made a good point in the chat room that uh, that actually revenues are, uh, FY22 revenues are getting so high that we prob- probably could fund government and the full statutory PFD without uh, uh, taking a draw from the permanent fund uh, earnings reserves. Right. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're going to, they've told us all these years, we can't afford a full PFD because we don't have the revenues. Now we're going to have the revenues. We're going to see what story starts, what, what story they start using now. Well, now we got the revenues, but we still are not, we're not going to pay you a full PFD. Uh, and, you know, you look at the House and we're even going to try to get away with with establishing the precedent of a 2575 PFD. What's the, re- you know, because because we don't want to give it to you because, you know, we need to do something else with that money. We need to spend it on this, that or the other thing. We're going to see what the stories are uh, from uh, from this point forward uh, as the revenues have come up. Um, and it's going to be a test of whether, you know, as a. Uh, However, you want to term the Republicans uh, in the in the House, including Kelly Merrick and including Sarah Rasmussen, who don't belong to the Republican minority, uh, we're going to see whether those Republicans, in fact, uh, are fiscal conservatives and can constrain spending uh, even as revenues come up. This is going to be a good test. Well, that. it's great to have the test before before an election cycle. Yeah. Now let me say this: some of them will say, "Well, I am a fiscal conservative. That's why I'm not giving a full PFD." I'm not I'm I'm going to hold back on this because that's the that is the sound fiscal thing to do. I'm not going to give a full PFD because we can't <laughs> afford it going into the future. So I am a fiscal concern. I can already see the arguments being run up. Yeah, that's that's going to be humorous because the PFD cut is a tax. Right. And so they're going to tell you that 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 they have to continue to tax you, but they're taxing you in the way that has the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. And has the largest adverse impact on the economy. So what they're going to be, what those quote fiscal conservatives are going to be telling you then, is we have to continue. Even with all these revenues, we have to continue to tax you, and we have to continue to tax you in the worst possible way, in order to continue to do whatever they, whatever whatever they think right. they're doing. So I so I yeah, I, I don't I don't see a good storyline for these fiscal conservatives, so called fiscal conservatives. Uh, uh, in the in the days ahead, either they're going to continue to tax by continuing to cut the PFD, or uh, they're going to they're going to uh, they're going to spend all that money and tell you, well, we still can't afford a PFD because we spend it all uh, on something else. Right, exactly. This is going to be interesting. And Brad, I liked how you I liked how you framed this argument. You know, the people are going to show whether they're true fiscal conservatives. I mean, this will be this will be an available talking point for anybody who's running for reelection. Um, and it, uh, I mean, it, it gives us a good opportunity to point out where people have fallen short of that fiscal conservancy. Yeah. And, 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 and it's going to be, I mean, the spotlight's going to be on Sarah Rasmussen and Kelly Merrick. Both of them are on house finance. The question, uh, what I'm going to be looking closely for is how Sarah Rasmussen and Kelly Merrick 
vote on on proposals to increase spending. I mean, we've already seen that the House Finance Committee substitute that's in front of House Finance right now is an increase of about $150 million uh, over uh, over what Dunleavy proposed. And we've already seen that it's a it's, it's an increase over the budgets we've had uh, during the past two years. Uh, but how are they going to vote? How are Kelly and Sarah going to vote on these things as they come up before House Finance? How are they going to vote on these issues when they come up before the House? And frankly, we're going to see whether they're actual fiscal conservatives or not. It, same thing's true of the of the remainder of the committee. I mean, you've got Bryce on there, you've got you know Neil Foster, you've got others on there who claim to be fiscal conservatives, and we'll see what they do. But the spotlight, I mean, Sarah Rasmussen wanted to be on House Finance. Good for her. The spotlight's going to be on her uh, about uh, about what uh, about what she's going to do uh, as these uh, proposals come up for additional spending. Well, and I think we're going to uh, we're, we're going to need to work very hard to show people that that's exactly what we've been talking about this whole time. That that is exactly what's going on, and this is where the rubber meets the road. And they've got to they've got to step up. And uh, and if they don't step up now, we're going to be you know we'll we'll we will we'll get what we exactly what we deserve in that regard. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see you know, step by step. That's why I created this chart. One of the reasons I created this chart to be able to follow step by step what's going on with the budget as we go through the, as we go through the remainder uh, of the session and compare it to uh, what's been done in prior years compared to what the governor proposed. And we're going to see how, you know, how tight a leash these guys are going to, are going to hold on spending levels uh, as we walk through the process. Jimmy asked in the chat room, and this is a question that comes up quite frequently, and you've actually answered it before, but I will ask it again because it comes up so frequently. And it says, Brad, are we getting enough for our oil? That's a that's a question. And I think you and I have had this discussion several times. Um, but, uh, you know, are we getting enough? Could Is there money on the table? So at lower oil prices, um, the answer is, is I think, yes. Um, uh, looking at, uh, at industry standards, looking at, uh, uh, at what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, you know, the cost structure and everything else, I think there was, was money being left on the table uh, at the lower oil prices. What happens as we, as we increase in oil price is the progressivity provisions of SB 21 kick in and the state takes more and more and more and more uh, at higher oil prices. Uh, we're now, you know, at lower oil prices, we were getting roughly uh, 35, let's, let's say in the $50 range, we were getting roughly $35 million uh, per barrel of, per $1 increase in the barrel of oil. So if the if oil prices went up by a dollar, that meant $35 million to the state at the prices, at the additional uh, dollars to the state on an annual basis. Um, at the price levels that we're operating at now, we're in the $80, $85 million range. So an, an increase of the price of a barrel of oil at this level by a dollar increases the state's take by $85 million. And so as we, as we step up and as the progressivity features kick in, uh, I think it's probably uh, that we're probably in the ballpark of what is reasonable at these price levels. Where, where I think we've been falling short is 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 what happens at the at the lower ends of the, uh, of so, the price range. So the progressivity portion of it is 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 wonky. Essentially, we're getting the right amount when it's high oil, but at the low oil, we're getting a little bit of a sticky stick. Yeah, I think that I think I think that's the fair I think that's the fair characteristic, and that's the reason, frankly, I supported uh, ballot measure one. Uh, last election cycle because we're in a low price cycle and I think we needed to address it. I don't, I, I did not think that ballot measure one in particular was the right solution, but the way the ballot measures operate is if you pass it, the legislature could modify it. Uh, it sort of opens up the subject and forces the legislature to deal with it. It puts a, puts a stop behind it. If the legislature doesn't deal with it, the ballot measure kicks in. So I, I think we needed to address it and I still think we need to address it at lower price levels. But now that we're in a higher price regime, uh, at, as long as we stay in that higher price regime, I think the progressive progressivity is capturing uh, a lot more of the value per barrel and, and making it a lot uh, 
a lot closer to uh, to uh, a fair split. And that aligns, of course, in part with what Mike Shower was talking about in the fiscal policy working group with uh, his saying, you know, two or three hundred million dollars more. That could all be addressed with that. All right. Well, I guess that moves us on to number two. Give me a tease for the inflationary factor and how it's going to affect us. So one of the next things we're going to start hearing out of the legislature is, oh, inflation. We have to start spending more uh, because of inflation. Inflation is going to drive up spending, and, and that's the justification for all this additional spending you're going to see. There are market measures of inflation, just like there is the futures market for uh, oil that, that gives you some estimates of what uh, market participants think uh, future oil prices are going to be. There are similar measures, market measures, of what market participants think uh, inflation is going to be. And, and we're going to look at those, and they're not the 7 and 10% we're going to hear some people talk about when they try to justify increased spending. They are much lower numbers. And we'll talk about those when we come back. All right, welcome back to the program. We're continuing now the weekly top three. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is uh, our guest, and we're going through the weekly top three. We're moving on to number two. We just finished up with House Finance's budget. Now we're talking about the inflation factor and what does it mean uh, for the state as they're going to try and increase the spending to offset that inflation. Brad, what's your take? Well, I think I think we're going to start hearing a lot of discussion uh, uh, in the legislature about, oh my gosh, inflation's exploding. You know, with high oil prices, that does drive inflation to a degree. Um, and, 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 and we're going to hear the offset to high oil prices, the offset to high revenues is all of a sudden, you know, we're going to have higher costs, inflation costs, uh, and, uh, and, and that, uh, uh, we need to, uh, we need to account for increased spending, uh, as a result of, uh, as a result of inflation. There are market measures of inflation, just like there is the futures market for um, uh, for for to, to to give you a snapshot in time of what uh, of what market participants think uh, uh, oil prices are going to be. There is essentially a futures market for uh, inflation, and it operates around um, it operates around. Uh, 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 the the treasury the treasury markets um, the treasury publishes uh, well treasury has two different bonds one bond is indexed for uh, inflation another bond another bond is not indexed for inflation the difference between the two uh, can be used as a measure for inflation the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of St Louis publishes those on a regular basis uh, and it's and it calls it the break even rate. Uh, and says that the the break even rate implies what market participants expect inflation to be uh, in the uh, in the next uh, period, uh, uh, depending upon which bond you're using. Uh, you can go to uh, the 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 information that the St. Louis Fed uh, publishes, and you can see those market inflation rates, uh, or you can see those break even rates. Uh, they're published for five years, seven years, and 10 years. So when uh, somebody starts saying, oh, inflation is going to be 7%, we have to start factoring in 7% inflation in the budget, you can go just like you can with, uh, with the crude markets. You can uh, go uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to, the, to the futures market and, and try to determine uh, what, the, uh, uh, what, the inflation rate, uh, re- what the inflation rate is. For the five years, just to give you the numbers, for the five years, uh, the future, the Fred, uh, Fred, the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis, the publishing that does, Fed says the the current uh, inflation rate, break even inflation rate for five years, is three point two nine percent. The current inflation rate for seven years, over seven years, is two point six nine percent, and the uh, inflation rate over the ten year period is uh, two point seven seven percent. Nothing anywhere close higher elevated during the first during five years for the five years but nothing even close to the seven years that i anticipate we're going to hear people talking about brad keith lee alaskans <clears throat> alaskans for sustainable budgets uh we're continuing to talk about the weekly top three how does inflation in the law lo- i mean so give us a long run view of what the inflation could potentially do in that regard so so the 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 governor's budget was was assumed a one percent inflation 
uh, his 10 year plan assumed 1% inflation and had and had growth over one year inflation. Uh, even at the time that that came out, inflation was higher. Uh, and so I went and used the 10 year uh, number from uh, the then 10 year number from Fred, which was about 2.5% and showed inflation growth over that period. And layer and in, in the in the work I've been doing since is layering increased revenues, increased revenues from higher oil prices on top of that increased spending uh, or on top of that inflation adjusted uh, 10 year plan. And we're still showing that we can afford uh, 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 at least a 50 50 PFD uh, without uh, uh, without uh, 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 having to adjust that because of because of increased spending due to uh, due to inflation. It, 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 when you when you you know elevate the inflation levels when you when you use uh, 2.77 now instead of the 2.5 that's going to affect it at the margin but that's how we need to be looking at this we don't need just like we don't need to be looking at 130 dollar oil and think that's going to last 10 years and and everybody jumped to one side of the boat and saying oh my gosh we're saved because we got 130 dollar oil for 10 years just like we shouldn't be doing that we shouldn't be saying, "Oh my gosh, inflation seven percent now." It's going to be that for ten years. We got to, you know, we got to adjust everything for ten years. We can't give PFDs because we're going to have to take into account that inflation is going to be at that high rate uh, over the ten years. We've got market measures for this, just like we've got market measures for oil. We've got market measures for inflation. And as we go through this discussion, as people try to claim that we need to increase spending to account for uh, to account for inflation. We're, we're, we're going to need to keep them tied down, just like we do on the oil side, just like when we say, no, it's not $130 for 10 years. This is what the market is telling us for 10 years. Just uh, We're going to have to do that also on the inflation side and keep them tied down and say, no, it's not 7% for 10 years. This is what the market is telling us. Ten, the 10-year 10 inflation, the market expectation of 10-year inflation right now is uh, is 2.77%. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. This leads us into number three, which gives us a opportunity to wrap things up uh, on time today. So let's uh, let's talk about that, Brad. So the um, uh, the Alaska Public Offices Commission (APOC), uh, which uh, governs uh, uh, governs uh, 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 campaign contributions and campaign finance, uh, issued a decision last issued a decision last week that said that uh, uh, all bets are off, all, all limits are off. This follows a Ninth Circuit decision which had rejected Alaska's uh, campaign limits as, uh, as I, I, think, I think it's appropriate to say is outdated um, because they hadn't adjusted for inflation. They hadn't, hadn't adjusted the amounts for inflation as, uh, as inflation had gone along. They've been stuck at the same levels for a number of years. Um, and so APAC, um, uh, and so APOC, uh, uh, following that Ninth Circuit decision, had initially said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to adjust uh, the contribution levels uh, for inflation for uh, 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 over a period of time. And those are going to be the new numbers. But there's no authority in statute that gives APOC the authority to adjust those numbers for inflation. The statute reads as a flat amount. And so the question was whether... Uh, uh, whether uh, uh, that was an appropriate reading or an appropriate action by APOC to put those limitations in. Um, and so APOC uh, this past week uh, reversed, uh, uh, reversed its uh, uh, decision on, uh, on, on putting in these artificial limits, the limits that they had determined that were not based in statute, reversed their decision and said, well, we don't have statutory authority to do anything. Uh, and so they released uh, uh, all of the campaign limits. And what we've got now is a situation in, in which Alaska has no campaign limits, no campaign finance limits, no limits on contributions uh, that can be given to uh, uh, candidates at the at the state level or at the local level. Uh, 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 they've, they've, those campaign limits are completely gone. That's a, similar to a situation in uh, in, in Oregon. And in the ADN story, in the in the in the Nat Hertz story on uh, on on this issue, uh, he quotes a, a a guy from Oregon, a lawyer from Oregon, who's a, has been observing what happened to Oregon when they did the same thing, and it says unlimited contributions are going to lead to just like we've seen in the Oregon legislature, big money, really beginning to stymie good policy, 
if you guys go to super high limits, and we have no limits now. I mean, APOC's taking out all the limits. If you go to super high limits, you're going to see bad public policy as a result, and you're going to have elected officials who are more beholden to the big money interests uh, up there. Well, we already have a problem with, with elected official, officials bending over backwards uh, to, uh, to, meet, uh, to, to meet the expectations of their campaign donors. I mean, that's what we've seen with the PFD. We've seen the legislature choose the, the, the revenue package, the revenue approach that has the largest adverse effect, effect on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and if we now go to unlimited campaign contributions directly to candidates, which is where APOC has put us, or where the Ninth Cir Circuit has put us, and now APOC has put us, uh, I think we're going to see even more of that sort of big money influence uh, on the legislature. Well, it's I something I hope that it's something I hope uh, the legislature addresses uh, before they're before they're done. If they don't, uh, we're going to have. Uh, a lot of money flowing into our state level and the legislative. Well, and I, year. and I'll say this. I mean, I, yesterday I, I pontificated on this a bit. I'm a, I'm a bit torn because I'm all about free speech and I think people should be able to, uh, I think people should be able to utilize their monies as a form of free speech. Uh, but I am concerned about excessive money coming in, but uh, somebody made a point to say, well, all those outside special interest packs, they don't have to really, um, they don't have to really uh, dis, you know, disclose who all the contributors are, just the top three. And so it gets a little more confuddled. It might be better if uh, politicians uh, had to do it and then they had to make sure that they were disclosing. But I guess we'll, we'll pick this up at another time. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for coming on board, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.